It's also about one of our favorite writers, Richard Russo, who's here tonight with us, uh, with his daughter Kate, a fine artist, and like us, we assume, an admirer of her dad's works. Uh, they're here to present their unique collaboration, Interventions, which is a handsome four-volume set of novellas which is slipcased with uh, Kate's wonderful artwork. The artwork you'll find is also for sale out in the lobby. It's, it's wonderful. Richard Russo is the author of seven novels, a collection of short stories, and the set of novellas. He's also written some fine screenplays, including the one for Empire Falls, uh, the novel for which he won the Pulitzer Prize. His memoir, Elsewhere, uh, will be out in November from Pinoff, and you can't have it. It's mine. <laughs> oh. Um, he lives in Maine, and along with Scott Tiro and a few others, has taken a leadership role recently in defending literary culture in the United States from certain online retailers who would sacrifice it in order to sell you Glock ammo, Huggies, and big screen TVs more effectively. Uh, tonight, we'll have readings and commentaries from the Russos, followed by a Q&A session, and finally a book signing out in the lobby where we have lots of copies of books new and old. Please join me in welcoming Richard and Kate Russo. tonight um, is um, begin by talking a little bit um, about the state of the publishing industry right now, which some of you probably know a little bit about. Um, I know a little bit about it, maybe a little bit more than, than, than some of you, but maybe not. We'll find out. That's one of the things that we'll, we'll do tonight. And it, so I will begin talking a little bit about um, the publishing industry right now, what the threats are uh, against it. Um, and once I've established kind of that context, um, Kate will talk to you a little bit about this particular book um, that we have been working on for years um, and uh, started thinking about around our dinner table um, with Kate's husband, Tom, who is actually the, the designer of this book um, and have uh, a topic that has engrossed many uh, family uh, conversations since the advent of... of <laughs> There's a lot of fun. Thank you very much. Yes. <laughs> First of all, can you all hear? Yes. Okay. Thank you for asking. Yeah. <laughs> um, some of you probably saw a couple of weeks ago a wonderful cartoon in the New Yorker which showed um, a couple of guys standing what, over what looks to be the first printing press taking off the first the first book from that printing press and looking at it, and the one guy says to the other, yeah, it's okay, but as long as people are interested in stories, they're going to want to read scrolls. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, I, I think the, the cartoon was wonderful, because like most cartoons that are wonderful, because it, it's true, and also because it points out uh, kind of the situation that we are in right now, and the publishing industry is, is in right now, in that when you're right in the middle of something, or even at the beginning of a technological revolution, it's really hard to know what it all amounts to. You kind of have to wait and see until the, until, um, the dust settles, but by, by the time the dust settles, it's too late to do anything about it. So, <clears throat> so um, the publishing industry has changed, and I'm just going to start off by telling you a little bit about what my life was like as a writer when I broke into this this business in, in 1986 uh, with my first novel, Mohawk. Um, at that time, um, strangely enough, um, what everybody was worried about was Walden books. You know, those, those, <laughs> were those, those suburban mall, ubiquitous um, bookstore, card shop, whatever. They were, they were all over the place. But, but when my first book came out, um, there was a um, there was a kind of ecosystem that was particularly beneficial to young writers like me. Um, one of the things that most people don't realize is that publishers have always been, in their own way, venture capitalists. They, they read manuscripts by 
by young writers that they don't know, and they say, hmm, this is kind of okay, this is pretty good, but then they try to factor into where, at the time, where will this author be in four additional books? And that was kind of the formula at the time, and I think it, I think it was um, John Irving, the John Irving formula, because The World According to Garp was, I believe, his fourth or fifth book. And publishers um, then were willing, to go, were willing to follow a talented writer, and you can often tell when a writer is talented, even when the book isn't very good. Um, but you can, you can tell, or many publishers and editors can tell, and so really for the first three, four, sometimes five books, you are, if you're a publisher, you are kind of venture capitalist, and, and you give a writer uh, a certain amount of money and say, go write this book, live on the money that I'm going to give you, give us the book when you're done, um, and, and, and really what, ha what, what you're doing is you're making that bet on a bunch of different people, hoping that hoping that there's a John Irving among them, <laughs> frankly. And, uh, um, and, and so not only are you giving money to somebody that you don't know whether they're ever going to, they're ever going to earn it out for you, you, you were also, at least back in 1986, doing some other things, too. Um, on my first book tour, which was not extraordinarily long uh, or, or large, um, I was sent to Chicago, which I remember vividly, um, to an independent bookstore named Barbara's, which no longer exists. Um, and at Barbara's Books, I was given, um, <clears throat> you know, a, a podium to stand behind, and they had optimistically set out um, six or seven chairs. Uh, <laughs> and, um, and I found out later that, that uh, when those chairs were occupied, they were occupied, of course, by all the employees of Barbara's Books. <laughs> so so um, I, I, did, I did my reading. Um, I signed books. I, I got to know the people in the bookstore. I signed their stock, which presumably they would be trying to sell uh, over the next his first novel, trying trying hard to sell over 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 the over the next months, um, and uh, and then I went back to what was uh, in in Chicago. It was a it was a four star hotel. Um, they they put me up the first time I was there. I think at the Drake, um, and so they had so uh, Vintage Books had paid me in advance. Um, they had put me on a flight to Chicago. They put me up at a very nice hotel. Um, they took me to Barbara's Books and then also to other bookstores where I would sign stock and, and meet independent booksellers. Um, and they put a small ad in the New York Times, uh, one of those little slivers down the side of the page. Not everybody gets those, but they did, they, did give, they, get, they did give me a small ad. And they aggressively sent that book around trying to get reviews, as many reviews as possible, in newspapers, we all remember newspapers, right? And we all remember <laughs> when they had book review sections. Um, and um, there was, was it just the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal and the Boston Globe and, and, and the San Francisco Chronicle? There were, there were great newspapers in, in Cleveland and Kansas City and St. Louis, and, and they all had book sections and sometimes reviewed books even in the middle of the week. So that's what I, that's what I mean when I say there was, there was a kind of ecosystem out there that was that was particularly beneficial to unknown writers like me and at the time I remember coming home from the end of that book tour and of course when you're an author there you get to look at you get to look at the hotel bill and you see when you cash in your ticket you see what the flight cost and um, I began to add it all up and thought oh my god I'm into these people for thousands and thousands of, of, of dollars on what, on what they've spent uh, on them. And how, how in the world will I ever, how in the world will I ever make that up to them? Um, well, that's 1986. Um, and it went that way for a while. Um, young writers were sent on book tours. Some of them were given ads in the New York Times. Um, some of them were, were um, were sent uh, to, if they were from the East Coast, were sent to the West Coast and vice versa and into the center of the country. Um, and these sums of money were, uh, were spent on the development of young talent. Um, and then it began to change. Uh, even before electronic books, it began to change. The margins began to be thinner. There was, newspapers began to fail. Um, there, were fewer, there were fewer outlets 
young writers started having a tougher time. Um, and it was only the more experienced writers with, with kind of household names that got sent on these. Others would be, would be sent on smaller tours, regional tours, you could do by car. Um, and some writers began doing what a great friend of mine, Howard Frank Mosier, does all the time. He just gets in his car, he spends the money that his publisher gives him, and then he just keeps going. Um, and, and, he, and he goes from independent bookstore to independent bookstore. Um, his book tours in his, in his own car often last the better part of three, four, or five months. Um, yeah, yeah, um, it, it's, 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 it's excruciating. So look at the, so we look at the world, we look at the world now, fewer newspapers, fewer reviews, fewer, um, um, fewer book tours, um, and the book tours that do exist, exist for um, the Richard Russos and the John Irvings and, and the Ann Patchetts of the world. Um, and um, not so much for younger people uh, breaking in. And, of course, um, you know, we went from, from the bully that was Walden Books to the bully that was Borders to the bully that was Barnes & Noble to now really the biggest bully we've ever seen in the world of publishing, which is Amazon. And, um, but it's online, it's online book selling in general. Uh, and the reason that I do this, I do, frankly, I do quite well with the Amazon model. Um, my friend Scott Turow does quite well with the Amazon model. Stephen King does very, very nicely, thank you, with the, with the Amazon model. Um, and so does Ann Patchett, who owns uh, an independent bookstore. Um, we're doing just fine. But the reason that some of us are speaking out the way we are, biting, in fact, the hand that, or one of the hands that feeds, that feeds us, is that book selling is becoming centralized. We're actually, many, many people in publishing are actually rooting for Barnes & Noble to survive, and they were last year's bully, yeah. right? But, 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 in, but in fact, with, with great independent bookstores, like Gibson's, uh, be, having, having been an endangered species over the last couple of decades, um, and book selling becoming centralized, um, Amazon now has 75% of the of they are the, the nation's largest bookstore. They have seventy five percent of all the books sold online, both print and electronic. Wow. They are fast approaching um, monopoly status, and they would have gotten there, I suspect, already if publishing hadn't adopted the the agency model, which the Department of Justice is now suing them about. But if you look at but but the greatest impact has been on young writers. Because you can imagine what happens if you don't go into great bookstores like Gibson's. If you're buying online, your behavior, if you think about it, is very different. Most people who buy things online know what they want to buy before they go there. Um, and they're very, they're very unlikely to, once they go, uh, go online, say, oh, that looks interesting, and buy it. Normally, they buy exactly what they go for, and they go there because they think they can buy it two, three, four, five, six dollars cheaper, or for flat screen TVs, you know, a, um, a few more dollars than that. It seems like a good deal, and let's face it, damn it, it's easy. Point and click, it arrives at your doorstep. If, 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 there's something about it that's, that's, very, that's very seductive. Um, but, if you go online to buy Scott Turow's new book, or my new book, or Ann Patchett's new book, um, and you see that, you know, there's, they, they have those little algorithms at the bottom, people who bought this, bought that. <laughs> have you ever noticed what they do? They're always, the people that they're telling you about are always people that you already know about. If you buy an obscure book of Peruvian poetry, <laughs> uh, on Amazon, it tells you people who bought this also bought, and then it will list 100 shades of gray. And, it, and because, of course, everybody's buying 100 shades of gray, so it's so so it so 50 shades of gray. Well, it seems like 100. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so so what's what's happening uh, when you when you browse on any online bookseller is that is that they're throwing you into the world of bestsellers and of bestselling authors about whom you already know a great deal. Compare that what with what happens when you go into a good independent bookstore. 
There's actually been research done which suggests that when you go into a good independent bookstore, you are much more likely to buy something that you didn't intend to buy when you went in. But further, you're much more likely to have bought an unknown author. And further than that, that unknown author that you bought that you didn't think you were interested in is much more likely to be young. In which case, you're learning about somebody, you're learning about somebody good who you're going to want to read over a lifetime after I'm dead and not writing books anymore. So, the importance, this is the reason we're going only to independent bookstores um, on this tour, um, the, the health of independent bookstores, um, and putting at least some sort of governor on Amazon and the other on online retailers, nothing less than the state of publishing and literature is at stake. Because the online formula simply is unsustainable if we want the pipeline to be replenished with great young talent. And I'm here to tell you it's there. I've done a couple, I've done a couple of, uh, been a judge on a couple of national contests um, for both short, short stories and first novels. The talent out there is breathtaking. And the, and, the, and the possibility of losing it because of this particular online model is terrifying to me, terrifying to, terrifying to us. And so we decided we would take, have some, little, some small part in this conversation by, by ourselves making a book. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know where to begin after all that. Um, no, I, 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 I moved to London in 2005 to do my MFA, uh, and it was, um, it was a time when really all of these things were really starting to change. Uh, we were hearing about these e-readers, uh, you know, these mythical e-readers at the time, and, um, you know, and, and the music industry was starting to change. We all had our iPods, and, um, and my husband, who's a photographer, uh, you know, who, who was raised on, in a dark room, um, suddenly <laughs> couldn't get a role of film developed. And, and so the, the, the conversation was, was really quite strong in our MFA courses, just about what exactly, um, what exactly we wanted to do as, as artists and as creative people. Did we want to speed up or did we want to slow down? Uh, and of course everybody was different, and we kind of, kind of split up into different camps, although I have to say I think that, that more people were on the slow down side than the speed up, and I think that that maybe is... Um, something about artists uh, that, that maybe isn't the trend with the, with the rest of the world. But anyway, I was coming home feeling a little bit more fired up about these things than I was before I left London. And I think that that's really where the discussion of the book started. Uh, my husband at the time, we met on this MFA course, and he was actually taking a bookbinding course while he was there. Um, something he never thought of to do, uh, but there it was. And he started it, and he really loved it. And, and when he met my dad, he just couldn't wait to talk about um, sort of the physicality of the book and the object and wanted to show him all these things that he'd been binding. And it was, it was funny because at that point, uh, the, the books weren't, the, the book book wasn't being as, feeling as threatened as it, as it does now. And I think it challenged uh, my dad into thinking, well, what about this book book? That, <laughs> what is it about this physical thing that we really love? And, and, and so we started talking about it. And, and we had sort of three unique perspectives on exactly um, what would make the book that we would want to see. Uh, my husband did all the design. He came up with the, um, the slipcase and the four, um, the four ind individually bound books. Uh, and I knew that I wanted there to be an artwork element and uh, one of the things I was interested in was, um, I go to antique malls a lot, I uh, like to troll around, and, and a lot of times you see these old issues of these kind of American painting uh, collective, and, and they come in this sort of, like, I think they call it a, a clamshell box or something like that, and you, and you open it up and in each, in each one is, is a kind of an individually bound um, <coughs> piece of, of writing and then the painting and you pull them all out each individually and, and that's and that's really what we were what we were thinking about was um, how can we make this uh, as tactile as possible um, and by making it as tactile as possible we're also making it um, really not translate into an e-format um, e-book format and so that's really um, 
it, it, it sort of started out as being something that we wanted to be very tactile, and then we sort of realized that um, also in that way it was also not going to be an ebook. Uh, and so I did uh, four paintings that, uh, and we'll talk a little bit about which stories we chose and, and why, and then did the paintings. But I also d um, designed the covers for the books. And then, and then with my dad's text, so we had sort of these three different elements that we knew that we wanted to put together. And I think we started, we started it with a story called Horseman, um, where it was, they, my dad wanted to start with a story I hadn't read, so we could kind of do a fresh, uh, fresh start. And it's a very dark uh, story about a woman who uh, becomes obsessed with the Windy Nights, which is a poem from Child's Garden Verses. And uh, she has never heard it until adult life. And uh, she is very frightened by this poem that's meant to scare children. But she becomes frightened by it as an adult. So, um, And this was a poem that my dad used to read to me all the time when I was a kid. Um, so, so I knew it well. Um, and, and, but it was an interesting scenario to have to come to this... Um, come to this poem um, trying to take it from an adult perspective, because of course I was thinking of it very much from my own childhood perspective. And I also had to kind of age myself, because a lot of the times my dad's characters are middle age, so I had to sort of move myself <laughs> forward and think about why is this frightening her? Um, what is it about where the stage in her life that is making her obsess about this poem? And so what I wanted to do with these paintings, because I, I have to say I'm not an illustrator, I'm definitely I'm trained as a, as a fine art painter, and so I didn't want to try to tackle illustration, I didn't want to um, tackle what, what is basically, though a visual language, it's a, it's, illustration is also a narrative language. They, it, you, you do have to think narratively in order to illustrate, and, and I don't think that way. So uh, I really wanted to take a moment um, from each story and really slow it down really try to encapsulate the story as much as possible uh, just in one painting, in one moment. And, and really that came down to taking a character, really trying to find what they're obsessing about, and then depict that. Uh, so that's what I've done, and, and that's what I did in, uh, in Horseman. There's a moment where uh, this woman is running uh, in the woods, and she's got the, the beat of this poem. I'm not going to attempt it. Would you like to attempt the beat of the poem? <laughs> whenever the moon and the stars are set, whenever the wind is high, all night long in the dark and wet, a man goes riding by. Late at night when the fires are out, why does he gallop and gallop about? <laughs> so, she, he, he, the, the story then goes on to describe uh, that she, she's running through the woods and she, and she finds that she's running to the beat of the poem, that she's clomping. Um, and she feels she's a horse uh, clomp clomping through these woods, and the woods gradually turn into a cemetery. And I just thought that that was just the darkest uh, thing to, to be thinking of, this woman running through the woods and feeling that the woods are turning into a cemetery, and, and, this, and this childhood poem really threatening her mortality. <laughs> and, um, and so that was the obsession for me. That was the really dark moment. That was that really sort of dark place that she was in. And... And that's what I responded to. And, and I think my dad was surprised that that's what I responded to. And that sort of well, launched the rest of the stories from there. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that, one, that wonderful sense of surprise was, was what made me know we were probably going to be on the right track. Because I, as, as Kate was working on it, of course, I thought, okay, is the horseman, if, will, she, will she draw the horseman? And if she draws the horseman, will it, will it be like the horseman from the child's garden of verses that that from, with which i had tried to terrify her and her sister all those years ago or would or would it be a new horseman would, would there something come from her own subconscious now as an adult woman would the, would the horseman have taken taken on some sort of uh, different aspect or dimension and of course i never dreamed what she would do which was to make us the horseman you'll see it out there if, if, if you haven't bought the book or seen any of the illustrations, you'll see it when you go out there. What you see is is the horse's head uh, as it as it goes through this kind of nightmare terrain, and that's all you can see. You're looking down at the horse's head, and you realize you're, you're, you are you are the horse you are the horseman. Which was I thought just a wonderful um, a wonderful um, stroke, and and that's and and there were many surprises in this collaboration because 
And we should talk just a little bit about the nature of, of, of collaboration when a writer works with an artist, or at least when Kate and I work together. Because it wasn't like we were in the same room. Um, Kate, you want to talk a little bit about the nature of the... Yeah, I think we, you know, I even hesitate to use the word collaboration in a lot of ways because I think people think of collaboration as, uh, you know, two people working on the same thing at the same time, which of course we weren't. Uh, so it really got to the point where, um, you know, the, for the most part, the paintings are inspired uh, by the writing. Uh, the, the only situation in which that's a little bit different is, is, the, is the title story intervention, which um, the, the story still came first, but it was, um, it was very much written with the themes of the other three stories in mind that had been previously written, so we knew that we wanted uh, obsession to be the string um, that, that attached all four stories and so I was I believe I was working on the paintings for the other three pieces as he was writing that story and I knew at that point that there was going to be another story involved so it was really very much us working um, separately but toward a common goal at the end of the day uh, and the, the paintings were very much uh, for me as as the, my dad did not ask my input on what to write I did not ask his input on what to paint either so it, it was really kind of a shot in the dark um, that it was going to work in the end of the day uh, I didn't know whether he was going to like the paintings I wasn't going to ask him um, ahead of time what he wanted me to paint so uh, it, it took a certain matter of trust I think to, to, to be on the same page which thankfully worked out it, it was it was um, both gratifying and a little bit startling uh, to see how easily my daughter slipped into my obsessions. <laughs> yeah, but this is that's exactly the, the sort of collaboration that that we had here was it was the trust of knowing that that um, it, at least on my part, um, you know, we're a family of we're a family of creative people, and, and that includes now Tom, our our, our son-in-law. And if you if you love the creative process, one of the things that you know is whoever you're working with, you want to you want to respect that process. And I didn't I didn't want to become <coughs> involved. <coughs> Certainly, I didn't want to become involved in Kate's process. Um, <coughs> I don't know what we'd have done if I'd hated her paintings, but I just couldn't imagine I would. It just didn't. It just didn't. Just, that just never seemed like like a, a real possibility. We had done something earlier actually. Um, with a novel of mine called that old Kate Magic, Kate had done some some beautiful broadsides uh, for one of my favorite is of a of a seagull uh, standing on top of an urn on the, on the middle of a beach, and we <clears throat> we we did that and and um, um, Kate got got that those there were, there were three of them actually um, one another one of a seagull casting the shadow of a woman which if you've read that if you've read that uh, that novel. Uh, you kind of get the idea of what that would be about. But um, Kate, they, they were absolutely beautiful, and uh, we took them to my publisher and had them, and had them I wouldn't say mass-produced, there, there weren't that many of them, a limited print run, and those were sent around to um, bookstores that had been selling, independent bookstores that had been selling my, my work for years. So, so I wasn't, um, um, having worked together with Kate on that, I wasn't at all surprised that um, as, as the as the illustrations, as the paintings um, started coming in, that I was uh, completely um, bowled over, and as I say, just kind of um, uh, marveled at, at, at how she went right to the heart of these stories and, and found something in them. And as, and as, as Kate was saying, just slowed it down, where narrative, where narrative is just chugging along and trying to go forward. Here she was trying to slow it down to a moment that would just kind of reveal the entire story. You still have to read it, of course. Well, yeah, I mean, that's the thing about obsessive thoughts as well as, you know, they're obsessive, they always return, and so I, I really wanted to pick uh, that moment that I felt, that sort of dark moment that all these characters with their minds were just, every time they were at their lowest, their brain is going right back to this really creepy dark thought in, the, yeah. <laughs> uh, in their head. So for that reason, it is, it is you know, it's, it's, not, um, it's not necessarily artwork that's going to make you smile, but, uh, <laughs> but it's um, resonant, at least, I hope, so. Well, maybe should we stop here and and ask and ask um, stop and ask if you would like to uh, ask some questions of us either about this book or our or our collaboration or uh, any thoughts on, on on publishing any any anything that we've talked about tonight or anything else anything else you'd like to um, um, to ask about.
Yes, ma'am, I saw your hand. I'm fascinated. I'm very fascinated when I see father-daughter bonding in the same uh, profession as John Cheever and Susan Cheever did. And uh, I'm very curious about, did you get an awful lot of respect for each other? Uh, how, how did that go? Um, yeah, John Cheever and Susan Cheever, and then you also know William Styron and his daughter Alexandra, who, who has written that stunning memoir of her, of her dad. Um, there, though, you've got a couple of writers. And you know, it, when, we were, when we were talking before about collaboration and the difference between what we were doing and, and, and being in the same room, like a, like a singer-songwriter um, uh, combination where one person does the words, the other person does the lyrics, we were not in each other's uh, proximity that much, but we were also not treading on each other's, on each other's toes, because we were. It's, it was more like the collaboration that you have with a, in a movie, where the writer is working with um, the director, who's working with the actors, who's working with you know. The, the, there's there's an there's an enormous collaboration. People doing different jobs, but many of those jobs overlap, and when they overlap, that's where the problems with collaboration come in. And so we're very we were very fortunate, I think because we were working in very different mediums, um, to, um, uh, to not have that particular worry of stepping on each other's toes. Uh, we were physically removed, but we were also removed by uh, the fact that Kate is working in the language of image and I'm working in the, la in the, in, in the language of words. That said, um, well, I, I, don't, I don't know if it was possible for me to have any more respect for Kate than I did um, already. But but um, um, I, I've been I've been watching her mature for uh, a long time, um, and, and Barbara, my wife and I my wife and I, I every now and then Kate would do something that would just blow us away, and we would say I would say Did you teach her that? Because I didn't teach her that, you know. And she'd say, no, I thought you taught her that. I I didn't teach her that. And it turns out that that that. Um, you know, as we all know, our, our children learn certain things from us, but but then they go on and, and they and they become um, and they become serious people. And what impressed me most uh, as impressed me most about about uh, this collaboration with Kate is that she has. This, I want to make this sound the wrong way. She has the same dogged perfectionism about what she does that I do that I have about what I do. Um, and in a way, I feel I almost feel like I owe her an apology because that, that's a that's a dubious gift to give a child <laughs> that that kind of that kind of obsessive perfectionism that that allows you that doesn't allow you to rest easy a lot. But that's what that's what what came out of this is is the the full realization of how far she had matured as an artist and as a human being. I, 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 I'm dying to hear what Kate is. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think the thing that surprised me the most is that actually, um, for my dad, this was this is was a risk um, in terms of taking on this project. Like he said, the Amazon model works for him. Um, he's always had, you know, I'll always ever since I was a kid, I would give my idea of what the cover of his book should look like, mm -hmm. and every time the designer would come out with something, and I, you know, and they're fine, but they're fine and and you know and I always I, I always had it in mind that I could that I could do better um, for, for these and and, and um, he didn't have to take this book on um, and not that I, I didn't I'm just like I went over thank him to take it on you know it was it was a natural it was a natural growth but it was also it was also a risk because it is um, it, the, the art element of the book um, makes it different. It makes it not a part of his model. And he was actually, he was incredibly open-minded to so many of the suggestions that we had for this book before we settled on this. We had the whole book folding out like a, like a big map that you can hang on the wall. And we were coming up with all kinds of weird stuff. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and, you know, I think it's really easy um, to become set in your ways and, and um, stuck in a system that works for you. And he was just so incredibly open-minded about the whole process of us 
of us putting this book together, and, and also letting me um, letting me do this 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 fairly dark artwork that didn't seem um, to frighten him, uh, and I was really pleased that it wasn't as frightening to him as it was to me. <laughs> so, um, and also, you know, I'm. Um, you need only to look at my other artwork to know that I'm very obsessive and that I do very detailed stuff and I'm actually an abstract artist by and large. Uh, so to, to do this was a real step out of my comfort zone, uh, to, to do representational work uh, that has a narrative theme to it. And, and, he, really, and he really trusted me to, to take that on. So I think it was, again, it, it, the relationship was so much built on trust, and, and, um, but that was there. That was there before we started the book, so that's what made it easy. Since the, the question of how this book was made came up, do we want to talk a little bit about materials used, how, how, how we made the book, um, the decision?